Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone around the globe joining us today. My name is Ina Erickson, and on behalf of Stockholm Environment Institute, I would like to welcome you to this webinar. Stockholm Environment Institute, also known as SEI, is an environmental think tank working to bridge research and policy. SEI is also known, is also, sorry, the co-lead of the Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program, which is one of six glo global programs under the 10-year framework of sustainable consumption and production. SEI and the SLE program have co-produced this webinar today, which will explore the role of local governments in advancing sustainable consumption. At SEI, we have a number of research projects on sustainable consumption. A particular project called Unlock aims to understand how incentive structures shape behavior at the local level in the pursuit of sustainable consumption by both residents and by local governments in Sweden. Taking the results of this research as a springboard for discussion, we have gathered an international panel to showcase the different ways local governments can act as key drivers for the progress on sustainable consumption. We have three panelists with, with us today. Karin Andrea, Research Fellow at SEI and Project Lead of Unlock. Lisbeth Cassier, Policy Advisor at the International Institute for Sustainable Development and expert member of the 10YFP Sustainable Public Procurement Program. And Vanessa Timmer, Executive Director of One Earth, co-lead of the Beacon for Sustainable Lifestyles and expert member of the Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program. Facilitating this webinar is Jonas Alerup, climate negotiator and analyst at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. Just before I hand over to Jonas, who will be kicking off this webinar with a presentation on Swedish consumption-based impact, I would like to mention that the chat function will be open for the duration of the webinar. Feel free to tell us who you are and from where in the world you're joining us today. And you can also post questions to the panelists or general questions, which we will address during the last 30 minutes of the webinar. Thank you and over to you, Jonas. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Aina. Uh, and thank you for the invitation, invitation to facilitate uh, this today's session. Um, for this event, we have three very prominent speakers with a wide experience and expertise in advancing sustainable uh, consumption on a local level. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hear from you all. Uh, before we start, I would like to remind you to use the Q&A poll uh, if you have any questions. Uh, if you have any clarification questions that you want to address, uh, uh, clarification uh, question for, for the presentations, you can just write them uh, in the poll and we will try to address them after the, the presentation. And all other questions we will uh, address in the end of the, this uh, session. And you can also write in English or Swedish, whatever you, you prefer. Uh, so I will start off while uh, we're giving a short presentation on the Swedish climate impact from, from consumption. Uh, as Aina said, my name is Jonas Allup. I work at the climate department uh, here at the Swedish EPA. Um, yes, let's get started. Next slide. So why is it important to measure consumption impact? And I think the best way to actually explain this is by this Sankey diagram, uh, uh, because this show uh, these pictures show uh, the flow emission from the whole Swedish economy. So, on we, so when we look at the left hand side, you can see the Swedish domestic uh, emissions. These are the emissions that we use to follow up on the climate goal. Uh, the production emission is when we adjust for foreign companies that have activities in Sweden and the vice versa. Uh, and after that, uh, we add the import emissions. Then we will end up in the, the emission from the total economy, which is 154 million tons. Uh, if we extract the export uh, emissions, then we will arrive in the consumption based uh, emissions, which is 82 million tons. Uh, and that is approximately eight tons per person and year for, for a Swede. Uh, 
Uh, and these emissions then includes the whole production chains. So that means, for example, if you buy a phone from, from China, for example, the, the emissions from the production and the transport will be included in this figure. Uh, so as you can see from this diagram, you actually get a broader picture of the emission caused by the whole Swedish uh, economy. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so what kind of habits impacts uh, the climate? Um, of course, it depends on what kind of lifestyle that you have at the moment. Uh, this can vary a lot, of course, between individuals, uh, since we have a lot of different starting points when it comes to economic resources, um, cultures, and so on and so on. So when we're trying to lowering your own climate footprint, I believe it's important to work in all, in all parts and on every level in the society with everything from promoting change, like nudging at the grocery store to taxes on plastic bags, for example. So, so uh, your personal choice has a huge difference when it comes to your own climate footprints. And maybe you have seen this picture before, but I think it really gives you a good overview on what kind of activities that actually has a high footprint uh, or not. Uh, and of course, if you have, uh, have if you account for having you, you know, one more child and you account for the whole lifetime that they have, the emission uh, will skyrocket that you see in this pictures. picture. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, the richest 10% of the world emits about half of the consumption based emission, while the 50% poorest emits about 10% of the total emissions. And actually, I saw the latest figure on this uh, is that actually the top 10% emit, emit actually 51%. So the emission equality, so to speak, has actually widened. Uh, next slide. Uh, so as I said before, uh, a Swede emits about one ton of greenhouse gas emission uh, per year and per person. The, the big challenge is of course to reduce these emissions to one ton on a global average scale. So some countries might need to be below, some countries need to, to be above. Uh, it depends a lot of your natural, natural circumstances. Uh, so example, for example, if a country has a large forest, it may act as a carbon sink and so on. So next slide. So how much is then one ton of greenhouse gas emissions? And you can just, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, it can be about uh, a trip to south of Spain with, with, with an airplane. That includes also the high attitude effect. It can be 30 kilos of red meat. That is about one third of the total re, re, uh, meat consumption for a Swede for, for a year. Uh, it can be 5,000 kilometers for one person in a car. Uh, 5,000 kilometers is about Stockholm to South and Nice, nice uh, back and forth. Uh, it can also be two meters of asphalt road, uh, 50 jackets, uh, or the PC work for two persons. Uh, so that is the production of the PC, but also the usage for two persons for the PC on a global uh, average energy mix. Uh, here at the Swedish EPA, we have focused on five consumption areas. Uh, for these areas, we have come up with different indicators. Uh, this is still, the, though, uh, an ongoing work. Uh, so this spring, we will publish the indicators on, on our web. Uh, we have chosen these areas because we think that they are the areas as, as as an individual that you actually can make uh, a difference. Uh, and 
this is these are the area also that we found that we actually have figures and data uh, that we can follow the climate impact and the consumption trade uh, trends and besides of the indicators how do we work with consumption well we we write a lot of reports on the consumption uh, their impact on the climate and also the the environment uh, we also have a lot of um, uh, we finance uh, finance a lot of research in, in this area as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the cross-party committee on environmental goal, uh, also called uh, in Swedish Miljömålsberedningen, uh, this is a parliamentary group that will start to investigate and give a proposal on goal for consumption-based emissions. And if they do so, and this is a really big if, uh, and the parliament accept them, uh, Sweden will then become the first country in the world to have uh, goals for consumption. Uh, the committee will also give a proposal for a milestone target for aviation, uh, and they will also investigate a milestone target for, for uh, uh, for navigation, sorry, a milestone target for aviation. Uh, that is what they are going to do. And they might propose a an, an, uh, milestone target for, for navigation. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, and the last of January in 2022, uh, we will see their proposal. And that was actually my last slide. Uh, I will check if there are any clarification questions in the in the poll and I can't see any. Uh, so then I will hand over the floor to Karin Andrian. As you mentioned, Aina, she's a research fellow at the Stockholm Environmental Institute. And Karin, you has you have also over 10 years experience in in environmental research. So please go ahead, Karin. Thank you very much, Jonas, and uh, hi to all of you out there. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about the results from a project that we call Unlock, about uh, local government drivers for sustainable consumption, that is funded by the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, and that is about to end this year. And it has been a collaboration between myself and my colleagues, Katarina Axelsson, Elena Dawkins, and Åsa Gerge Svartling, and I know that you are listening to this webinar as well. And the focus of my presentation today is the challenges and opportunities of Swedish local governments in driving sustainable consumption. And it builds on our results from the Unlock project. And as Jonas just very nicely presented, uh, the importance of taking a consumption-based perspective when talking about emissions and uh, environmental degradation and so on. And in this project, we have not focused on any specific consumption areas, but we wanted to have a broad approach looking at different kinds of consumption areas from the local government perspective. And it has been a growing agenda. The need to look at sustainable consumption has been in focus for over 10 years or, or even more, where we see an increase now. And in Sweden, we have the national strategy for sustainable consumption, and we also have the generational goal. And there was actually an early definition of sustainable consumption already in 1994 that stresses the importance to look at the life cycle of products and look at the total consumption, the emission from the consumption of products, no matter where they are produced. And um, the generational goal in Sweden also stresses that the patterns and um, of consumption of goods and services should cause the least uh, possible problem for environment and human health. And we also saw that in the academic literature, there's quite a lot of focus on individual consumers and also national, international level. But as it comes to local governments, there was less of research focusing on this specific challenge of what it means to actually consider emissions uh, that is not territorial or direct emissions, but also the consumption-based emissions. So we wanted to further understand, next slide please, 
what is the role of local governments and what are the opportunities and barriers for local governments to address sustainable consumption. And as you can see here, we have a few examples of different uh, functions or roles of local governments. And this is from a Swedish perspective, but I think it's valid in many different contexts as well, where we see that local governments are a provider of societal services, uh, for instance, schools, waste, social care, etc. They also are an enforcing authority. They are a large procurer. They are also a planner for sustainable development and can also act as the catalyst to facilitate changes in consumption practices among households and other local actors. But they are also a large employer and they collaborate in partnership and network. So the role of local governments is quite varied and we wanted to further understand what, what does this mean in practice. Uh, next slide, please. So the focus for today's presentation is that I will present some of our results regarding how do municipalities in Sweden work with sustainable consumption today and what makes their work easier, and what gets in the way of addressing sustainable consumption. And lastly, we have had a specific focus area of the use of data and indicators and do they actually provide an incentive for work or what is missing here. Next slide, please. And in the Unlock project, we've used a multidisciplinary and mixed methods approach. And uh, as I said before, today I'm presenting a synergy of results from all these different methods, but I'm just going to briefly introduce to you what we've done over the past three, four years. So we started with an international literature review and desk-based studies of what does the academic literature say about the role of local governments in relation to sustainable consumption and where we analyzed about 61 studies that specifically addressed this issue. We also carried out a national web-based survey to all Swedish municipalities in 2018 and here we targeted environmental or sustainability, sustainable development strategies officers or similar and we got a response rate of 41 percent corresponding to 119 municipalities. And also we worked with the two Swedish municipalities and we did two in-depth case studies together with Lund and Upplands Väsby. And in, this, uh, in these case studies, we used participatory research methods and we met uh, a group of municipal officers representing different departments in focus group meetings and workshops. And we also did some interviews. So we met them over the course of one and a half year and discussed various aspects related to their work with sustainable consumption. So next slide, please. So some of the results then you can move on. Yes, so how do municipalities work with sustainable consumption today? And we see that Swedish municipalities actually take an active role in promoting sustainable consumption. And as you can see on the right hand, about 60% uh, of the municipalities stated in the survey that they work systematically to address sustainable consumption within their own operations. And somewhat fewer also said that they did this within for the residents and about 25% said that they were working with sustainable consumption in relation to businesses and other local actors. But uh, interestingly, in the academic literature, we've, it was actually quite difficult to find articles that uh, stated uh, very clear that, that they use this sustainable consumption as a concept. So it seems to be a gap between what is reported in the academic literature and what is actually going on in practice. In the survey, we also found that about 25% have a consumption based emission reduction target. And that is something that we've understood is quite important because if you have a target, it also means that you have to work towards this target that, that could act as a, something that facilitates your work and together the efforts or resources needed, even though it's still very difficult to follow up on that target, which I will come back to later. We also see that the, the measures that the municipalities are working with target many different consumption area, areas, such as their own vehicles, food for own operations, energy consumption, etc. And you can read more about this in the report about the, specifically present the survey results. And what type of measures or policy instruments are they working with? And here we see also similar to literature that 
is a focus on informative, like information campaigns, education, and also administrative policy instruments, uh, strategies, and, and so on. And uh, related to that, procurement is identified as a very important area and also as an opportunity to address sustainable consumption within the purchases that the municipalities do. But this is also a very challenging area and demands quite a lot of resources and also just a lot of knowledge gap currently. But I guess we will hear more about that later on today. Yes, thank you. So what help or what resources and support do municipalities need and what gets in the way? And so what are the enabling or constraining factors? And what we see is politic political support is indeed essential, both uh, as a driver, but also when it's lacking, it's very difficult to address sustainable consumption within a municipality. Similarly, we see that financial resources is also something that is asked for, whereas economic incentives is also mentioned as an important driver. And this also tells us a little bit that it's difficult to address sustainable consumption on its own, but you need to see the wider picture and uh, also look at the synergies between different goals in relation to this. And we also see that uh, more support and guidance from the national level is uh, something that is needed and currently lacking. And uh, related to that, we see that uh, currently local champions and uh, stack capacity knowledge and time is something that also is important. And in uh, when we lack the kind of steering from national level, local champions are indeed very important to drive this forward. And in the case studies, it was also brought up, for instance, that cooperation between departments was very beneficial for their work and you need to work across departments to get forward. And also the role of networks, collaboration and uh, collaborating with other actors is also something that is uh, positive and where, where you have that, it's also acting as an enabling factor. Yes, so this is just an example from the survey again, which shows what I just talked about, but in a different uh, way. And here we see that political support is in top, followed by financial resources. And uh, I will end this presentation by talking a little bit about indicators. And as you can see in this slide as well, tools to monitor work and follow up on work is something that is also asked for. So I think we can leave this here and I talk more about the indicators. Thank you. Yes, so how do municipalities currently use data and indicators and do they provide an incentive for their work? So as we see today, indicators of progress towards sustainable consumption is actually lacking at the local level. We have the national footprint indicators, for instance, about the greenhouse gas emissions, as you can see on the right hand here. But as the municipalities, you don't know what's your share in this. And this is something that we discuss quite a lot, that in order to identify if, if your measures are effective or not, it's very important also to be able to show or illustrate via indicators that how the emissions from, from your own municipality. And uh, despite, even though we don't have the local level footprint indicators, they are important to understand and uh, yeah, yeah, understand a concept of sustainable consumption, which could be quite challenging sometimes as it involves so many different things. Lack of data is another issue, of course. It's difficult to get all the necessary data to develop a good indicator to know that you measure the right things. And uh, why is, is it important to have good indicators? Yet, as I mentioned before, it's about to be able to evaluate your policies, but also to get, or, to get engagement uh, and increase the awareness and uh, secure future commitment so you can actually follow up on what you do. And lastly, even though I stress the importance of indicators for understanding the progress towards sustainable consumption, it's not the uh, we also need uh, institutional structures and and uh, yeah, the support uh, to work with it. So it's not only the indicators, but also the, the general context and environment for working with sustainable consumption that is 
important. And I didn't mention it before, but we also see that the awareness and and the the let's say, yeah the awareness and the municipalities work with sustainable consumption has been increasing over the last decade where it has been seen as quite sensitive but in the general debate in society and regarding the climate change emissions and all of that so it has been more and more accepted to work with yes thank you so to sum up some of our conclusions so generally, we see that there is actually a quite broad knowledge base among Swedish local governments about sustainable consumption and the impacts of consumption. Uh, but, uh, and also related to that, we see that uh, they have significant opportunities to promote sustainable consumption, primarily within their own operations, but also among household, households and other actors, even though this can be seen as quite sensitive topic to to address as regards to individuals and residents. And uh, even though we see that a lot of work is going on, it's not yet well integrated at the local level. And it's, we have focused on certain areas and it's still a quite large dependence on key people, but you need to also take a overall perspective when you're addressing sustainable consumption. And lastly, we see that uh, there's a great need for political support, but also different types of resources, financial competence, etc. So to sum up what is needed and what are our recommendations based on this research? Well, to increase the efficiency of the implementation of instruments and measures to address sustainable consumption, we see that it's a uh, a great opportunity and and uh, would be good to further strengthen municipalities opportunities for continuous learning but also to exchange experience and collaborations between municipalities but also across levels and here we see a need for clear guidance and support from the regional and also the national level and as i said previously it's important also to ensure that there is a broad political support to prioritize sustainable consumption and related to the first point here, to also strengthen the collaboration around sustainable consumption between different levels. And also we see a great opportunity for regional actors such as the county administrative boards to enable, to enable better knowledge co-creation and coordination gains because as I said initially, there are about, or not about, there are 290 municipalities in Sweden and uh, it's important to, also not every single municipality needs to drive this work forward, but uh, you can coordinate efforts and learn from each other so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel yourself. And all these municipalities have also different conditions and uh, prerequisites to work with this. Yes, and if you want to read more about what, what I just presented, you can see our published articles, but also we have a few articles and reports in preparation. And I guess you will, uh, published the presentation later on, so you can go back to this slide and take a closer look. But if you take the final slide, you can also visit our website where we also published all, all reports from the project. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Karin, for this very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I think that it has come in one question in the, in the chat but it's not a clarification question uh, as, as as i can see so i will think we will save it and please uh, feel free to write more questions uh, it's really nice uh, to see that somebody had, had broken the ice uh, so i will leave it over to Lisbeth kaiser uh, she is a policy advisor at the international institute for sustainable development uh, Lysbeth is also works, works extensively with the European Commission, uh, the Inter-American Develop, Development Bank, the World Bank and the, and the OECD. Uh, so very welcome, Lysbeth. Thank you very much and uh, thank you so much to the, the Stockholm Environment Institute for, for inviting me to today's webinar. 
really looking forward to uh, to discussing with you all, and I've been enjoying very much the presentations of um, <coughs> of Jonas and Karin. Um, and I believe um, with uh, with my presentation, I can uh, very much build on the on the research that uh, that you both have done and speak a little bit more about the power of procurement, uh, the power of the the public purse. Uh, as a driving force for sustainability and innovation and how procurement and sustainable public procurement can really help uh, municipalities, but also regional and, and national governments to reduce their environmental footprint, but to also use public procurement uh, to drive uh, more social well-being, to reduce inequalities. And what I'll be doing uh, throughout my presentation is to touch upon some of the uh, examples that uh, we at ISD have seen in our work. We've been working on, on public procurement for more than 10 years now. And um, when I started working uh, about, about seven years ago on, on public procurement, at first I, I remember conversations with, with my director asking myself, but why are we actually working on public procurement? Back then the topic wasn't uh, as much in the spotlight as, as I think it is today. And on the next slides, um, you'll see uh, why we have actually, and if you press one more, please, one more, then you'll see that uh, Public procurement represents on average globally 15% of a country's GDP. So it's actually an enormous instrument that governments can use through their public spending to support strategic goals. Be this the reduction of GHG emissions, be this uh, advancing uh, sustainable consumption and production altogether, uh, advancing social goals. Uh, but we also see that today it's uh, not yet been utilized to its full potential. And so what, well, what I want to touch upon in my presentation is how can how can we really leverage that that power of public procurement and how can we do how can we do better? And I think um, and on the, the next slide, um, what we see is that today we're in a situation uh, of the of the pandemic where uh, governments are planning enormous amounts of public money to be spent through recovery funds, through the building back uh, better strategies. So we have an enormous amount of public money that is going <clears throat> to flow outside uh, of, of governments over the next years. A lot of that will be spent through public procurement processes. And at the same time, we find ourselves in a situation where internationally, but I think also regionally and on national levels in most countries, we see an increased demand for implementing the sustainable development goals, for looking uh, into a, a low carbon future and for more innovation to help us make that happen. So it is really procurement's time to shine today to help deliver on those goals. Um, and here on the on the slide, you see a couple. No, sorry, back to the previous one. Um, what you see is a couple of examples of the international, regional uh, frameworks, policy frameworks that have really helped put sustainable public procurement on the map. Uh, sustainable Development Goal 12, um, which speaks to the shift towards sustainable consumption and production, includes a specific reference to using public procurement as a means to achieve that. But we also see that throughout the Sustainable Development Goals, there will be a large investment, both public and private, needed uh, in infrastructure. Now, infrastructure is uh, the largest area of public spending where we need to make sure that when governments build or uh, rebuild infrastructure, that we take into account sustainability aspects, ranging from reducing environmental footprints to, um, to more well-being uh, for citizens. Some of the other uh, frameworks that are currently in place and really advance the discussion on sustainable public procurement are also the uh, EU directive on public procurement, uh, which about five years ago um, underwent a complete reform and actually places value for money as uh, at the center of what public procurement needs to, needs to deliver. There's an OECD recommendation on public procurement as well. Contrary to the 
administrative function that it uh, used to uh, used to be, or at least the branding of the function was very much that this is a back office office function of government. We see also in that OECD recommendation that their public procurement is much more advanced towards having a strategic government function. On the next slides, um, you'll see that what we at ISD, but I think also increasingly uh, uh, government counterparts understand as sustainable public procurement is that it is really about delivering value for money across the life cycle of goods, services and infrastructure projects. There are different definitions uh, floating around on what sustainable public procurement uh, means, but uh, this is the definition that, that we have been using throughout our work because it allows a conversation around what is it uh, that value means beyond price? What are the quality aspects of, of the goods and services that we are buying that are important for us towards the goals that we're trying to achieve. Uh, and, and so in the presentations, I, I believe of, of Jonas and Karin, we've, we've heard a lot about the lowering of the GHG emissions. That is certainly an aspect that features here uh, in the value discussion. So when it comes to implementing sustainable public procurement, we have seen on the next slide, please, that there are two groups of uh, issues uh, that need to be addressed. The first one, um, in a recent OECD uh, study, we've seen that risk aversion in government is actually barrier number one to using public procurement more strategically towards sustainability, towards the lowering of GHG emissions, towards any kind of goal that a government is trying to achieve. So that kind of risk aversion needs to be needs to be addressed and I'll, I'll point at some ideas, practical ideas up for discussion to what we can do to address risk aversion. And the second thing is that procurement needs to be directed at sustainability. This can be in a traditional procurement process through introducing technical specifications that are green, uh, that are asking for social requirements, uh, etc. Now, another way to go about this is not just by intersecting sustainability in a traditional procurement process, but is really daring to rethink what it is that we need to buy, what it is that we want uh, a solution to perform. Do we want it to be more energy efficient in the future? Um, and so it's also about rethinking that whole procurement process and to assisting procurement agencies to, um, to be able to do that. So um, on the next slide, the first thing that needs to be in place for municipalities, for any government agencies, is a strong enabling legal and policy framework that connects public procurement to sustainability. And what's at the core of that is that we need to be able, and public procurers need to be able to move away from purchasing based on the lowest price to best value. And in, in procurement language, um, the, the typical principle that you would want to see uh, in, in legal and policy documents around this is that procurers need to be able to uh, award contracts based on the most economically advantageous tender or the meat principle. And now, thankfully, over the past 10 years, we've seen, I would say, almost a revolution in procurement frameworks where that is certainly possible. Um, ISD um, traditionally used to do a lot of work in Latin America and Asia, where I think almost all the legal frameworks have moved away from the lowest price principle, moving towards value for money, best value. For example, in Peru, the revised procurement laws in 2014, they center value for money, which is the enabler for buying sustainably. Sometimes we also see um, the reference to sustainable public procurement in more sectoral regulation. So, for example, in, in Costa Rica, in the waste management uh, frameworks, there, there is the reference to public procurers who must promote um, the procurement and use of materials and products with little or no environmental footprint. 
So while the reference to green procurement there is not within the public procurement framework, there is the sectoral regulation that actually promotes it further. And it's very important to address a culture of risk aversion in government by providing those certain legal frameworks and those policy frameworks that procurers can use to go to go out and buy sustainably. On the next slide, um, what we advocate for is that there need to be processes in place that procurers can follow to redefine the need of what what they need to buy and to include aspects of sustainability performance to really get the most out of the potential of public procurement. It's not enough to just introduce green or sustainable specifications into the tendering processes. It really requires that rethink of the procurement system. So rather than describing in technical specifications what the, the exact solution is that you need, uh, that you think you need as a public procurer, something that we are putting forward is that let suppliers innovate and provide you with the best available technology. Because one of the challenges with public procurement over the years has been is that procurement agencies are getting burdened under the enormous requests that they suddenly have to go buy sustainable, they have to buy green, they have to pay attention to all kinds of requirements. And it is impossible, we think, today to expect from procurement agencies that they have the latest knowledge on the sustainable solutions out there. So what's, what is important is that we equip them with a, a way to engage with suppliers, to engage with the market and to, to gather market intelligence of what is actually out there. And that is where we uh, very much advocate for performance-based uh, procurement. So for example, um, on one of the, the procurements from, that I saw a couple of years ago, is that to buy sustainable bike lanes, and this is an example from, from the Netherlands, the tender requirements didn't specify uh, the exact recipe of the low carbon concrete that they wanted to be, to be used in the construction project. But what they did in the tender is to specify the ask for the reuse of secondary products in the concrete mix and a lower CO2 footprint of concrete production. So what they did by using those performance-based specifications is to incentivize suppliers to look out for the solutions themselves. And that's a way um, for public and private to work better together and at the same time for procurement to stimulate innovation in the areas where we need it most. On the next slide, um, an idea um, and that is increasingly being used is to start establishing competence centers where knowledge can be bundled. Knowledge on innovation procurement, knowledge on sustainability, where procurers can go, share knowledge, share best practices, but where also advice can be given on what the exact uh, sustainability performance you might be looking for in a specific area of public spending. Um, there is, there's currently, um, oh, the project might have been closed already, an, an European network of uh, competence centers on public procurement and, and innovation that's called Procure to Innovate. Uh, where um, an assessment was made of different competence centers that play a role in helping procurers. And especially, I think, for municipalities and local governments, it's important that they have a place to go to where they can find out more information to, uh, to go about sustainable public procurement. The next um, is the idea that, uh, or what's, what's very important on the next slide, um, that public procurers need to be able to engage with the market. On the one hand, it means that uh, procurement agencies should, as much as they can, inform the market outside of any specific tendering process on what it is that they are going to buy, what the sustainability criteria are, or what the, the strategic goals are that 
a municipality or a, uh, or a regional government, for example, is really after. Because that helps the market, helps suppliers to actually prepare and understand today the procurement agency might not mandate sustainability criteria in a procurement process, but tomorrow or five years from now, those are becoming mandatory criteria. And so the market can prepare to start delivering towards those. And that's a huge incentive because the, the amount of public spending is, is quite large. Um, there are specific tools for procurement agencies under the legal frameworks that they have in which they can interact with the market, with suppliers in a transparent way to actually encourage competition. Um, for example, the city of Eindhoven years ago um, had uh, already engaged in online dialogues with suppliers on ideas on how to increase energy efficiency for municipal buildings. Uh, and that was a very successful uh, process uh, through which they also discovered new suppliers, new startups in the environment that could actually deliver the best uh, energy efficient solution for their for their buildings. The reason why I put on this slide a focus on small and medium sized enterprises um, is actually twofold. First, um, SMEs, while they are bringing actually a lot of the innovative solutions in the sustainable development domain, they often don't have sufficient access to the procurement market. Um, the reasons, therefore, are that it's a cumbersome process, um, but also that procurement agencies are often not deliberately going out to actually attract the attention of SMEs to the potential of procurement contracts. And so in a time where uh, currently we are seeing a lot of job losses, especially uh, in the SMEs uh, today. We believe that it's very important that procurement agencies in the next years are going to focus and target SMEs specifically for sustainable procurement because they're a motor of job creation and they provide a lot of innovative solutions that we that we need today. Then finally, on the next slide, uh, I want to end with something that I believe I also saw in uh, in Karen's presentation that in general to make sure that uh, local governments, but national the same um, are capable of actually consuming sustainably or procuring sustainably. Um, there is need for capacity building. There is need for interdisciplinary procurement teams. There is need for regular training. Uh, and there is also a need for building capacity for suppliers or for bidders who need to know what the procurement processes look like, what the criteria are, and to better understand the strategic goals of, uh, in, in this case, for example, municipalities. It's very important to invest sufficiently into ICT and e-procurement systems to support procurers to be able to undertake also the monitoring of what it is that they are buying. It can tremendously facilitate their work uh, and it can provide additional access for SMEs to the to the procurement market. And on my uh, final slide, I want to highlight the, the work that the One Planet Network has been doing in the sustainable public procurement space. So there is an SPP program where I would encourage you all to go take a look because I think today there is a wealth of information out there on best practices on sustainable public procurement on the green side, on the social side, um, where uh, the One Planet Network is doing a great job in, uh, in actually bundling all, uh, all that knowledge together. Um, so I will end there, but very happy to take, uh, to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisbeth, for this really informative uh, presentation. Uh, I don't see any clarification questions in the chat, but I see that there's a lot of people from different countries all over the world. So that is really nice to see and really nice that you're actually writing your affiliation and where you're from. Uh, so I will hand over to our last speaker. Uh, that will be Vanessa Timmer. 
she is an executive director at One Earth and co-lead at the Beacon for Sustainable Living. Uh, Vanessa is also a senior research fellow at Ultrek uh, University. So you have the floor, Vanessa. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Jonas, and the Stockholm Environment Institute. It's great to have all of your all of the participants also, including friends and colleagues here on this webinar. Uh, I'm joining you here from my hometown of Vancouver on the west coast of Canada. It's also the home of my nonprofit One Earth. And as Jonas was mentioning, we work on advancing sustainable living uh, both here in southwest British Columbia on the west coast of Canada, as well as around the world. And we define that as living well justly within our ecological footprints. We're also a member of the multi-stakeholder advisory committee for the One Planet Network Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program. And today I'm contributing a case study on how sharing initiatives are being supported by local governments. And I also wanted to explore with you about how we can scale these efforts to focus on lighter everyday living. So to start, let's. I want to draw your attention to two useful reports on sharing cities. So the first is this one on the left, which is the sharing cities activating the urban commons by the nonprofit Shareable. It showcases over a hundred sharing-related case studies and model policies from 80, more than 80 cities in 35 countries. You can download it for free on the website that I've provided. And I just want to note that sharing is the norm for many people around the world. It's also a really great way to be resourceful. Uh, it's particularly common amongst um, uh, uh, people who do who are don't have enough resources and they need to share in order to meet their basic needs. So just wanted to note that there's, of course, lots of policies, but there's also informal sharing happening around the planet and local governments can support that. The second resource you're seeing is also a free resource. My nonprofit One Earth did this local governments and the sharing economy report uh, focused on uh, local governments in North America, but it's also uh, relevant for uh, local governments around the world. It's a roadmap aimed at supporting strategic action by local governments. And in it, we profile the city of Vancouver and the ways in which it's enabling sharing of mobility, spaces, goods, food, and community sharing. That's just one case study amongst many, and it also goes into lots of details on how local governments can be strategic in this area. But let's dive into this case study uh, of the city of Vancouver. Next slide. The city of Vancouver is um, home to 675,000 people of diverse population, and the sharing actions that the local government is taking are linked to a number of city priorities. One of them is the climate emergency. So our local government passed a climate emergency statement and just on November 17th passed the climate emergency action plan to actually take action on that uh, on the recognizing of the climate emergency. We're very much focused as well in the city on equity, diversity and inclusion, affordability, sustainable transportation, housing and food, zero waste, ecological footprint reduction, resilience, and community con connection. So I wanna give seven examples of how the city is enabling sharing within the context of those city priorities. The first one on the next slide is car sharing. So since 1997, the city of Vancouver has supported the expansion of car sharing, including as you're seeing in this photograph, the Modo Car Cooperative, and also car sharing companies like Evo. And the way that the city does this is it raises it, the profile of car sharing through efforts such as the Greenest City Initiative, both within the city amongst our citizens, but also to other cities to get them to adopt progressive car sharing policies. The city also provides dedicated parking spaces on city streets in private parking lots and provides residential parking permits. And this makes the car sharing uh, opportunity much more attractive and, and easy to use. It's also, uh, they also facilitate the, the integration of care sharing agreements into multifamily developments, which allow communities to de be developed around car sharing and also focusing more on local walkability. It's uh, interesting that the city of Vancouver also uses car sharing uh, uh, gr um, uh, vehicles for their own staff use as well. So it's part of the internal uh, procurement in a way uh, as well. Next slide. 
the city has been involved with giving grants for sharing startups. So, for example, the Vancouver Tool Library, which was established in 2011, the Tool Library provides access to and sharing of tools used for everything from bike repairs to metalworking, electrical, plumbing, and home gardening jobs. It also provided a grant to a separate um, startup called Share Shed, and this is an app that connects people wanting to rent outdoor adventure equipment with people looking to rent theirs out, um, and it allowed uh, people to access healthy outdoor activities, make it more affordable, but also reduce the consumption of this new equipment and also enhanced community connections in a place where outdoor adventuring is a big part of people's daily lives. Next slide. The city is actually supporting research on sharing, uh, such as the Sharing Project, which enabled researchers to uh, survey and analyze Vancouver citizens to, to determine how people share in Vancouver and to highlight opportunities for growth in the local sharing economy. And since 2010, the Greenest City Scholars Program from with the University of British Columbia, you see everyone standing on the steps, the recent Greenest City Scholars of the city of Vancouver here. It's engaged over 100 graduate students from UBC's, from the University of British Columbia's Vancouver campus to gain experience with the city and work on research projects, including on sharing. And in an ongoing role, the city supports a really interesting enterprise called City Studio. It's an innovation hub in collaboration with the post-secondary universities and institutions and colleges where students, community members and city staff design experimental projects to make Vancouver more sustainable, livable, joyful and inclusive. And some of these projects included a sharing map so a map of where sharing was happening done with Shareable, the nonprofit I mentioned earlier, an orphaned spaces map where they looked for underused spaces in the city and, and found ways to use those underused spaces, Britannia food share, recreational sharing libraries, salvaged materials markets, and the development of new community gardens. And the city's also um, focused on how those projects can be scaled up. The city aims, the city of Vancouver is mainstreaming reuse and sharing through a number of initiatives. So we can go to the next slide. Um, well, first I'll tell you about the Greenest City Fund, which is a partnership between the Vancouver, uh, between the city of Vancouver and the Vancouver Foundation, which gives grants across the province of British Columbia. Some past grants of this granting stream include the Thingery, which is a community owned lending library of things and a modified shipping container created by Chris Diplock, a Vancouver resident. The, count, the containers are self-service, so members check things in and out at their own convenience. And for sharing food, there's also the Cedar Cottage Food Network, which has received a grant for a community orchard project, an urban orchard of fruit trees for sharing food amongst neighbors, and Village Vancouver's Westside Permaculture Corridor for the same for the same reason. Next slide. So in terms of mainstreaming reuse, they um, allow goods to be swapped at community centers that are city supported, such as clothing swaps. They promote sharing on um, sharing on social online platforms. So sending people to buy nothing and zero waste, for example, Facebook groups. They added reuse and sharing to repair cafes and fix it clinics and their zero waste centers. They're enabling city led yard sales or garage sales and supporting things like the share sheds or free sheds for sharing. Next slide. In terms of sharing food, uh, a quick response to COVID-19 epidemic um, for those who are in need was to actually match an over uh, supply of food with those to share it with those who need food. So this COVID response was a big uh, part of that sharing food and it's part of a larger program with the regional Metro Vancouver on enabling, enabling food recovery and sharing. Next slide. The city, of course, has a lot of city owned biz, uh, buildings and facilities, and many of these are offered up for sharing, including community gardens and parks. I mentioned the community centers used for swapping and, uh, for example, clothing swaps or other toy um, or garage sales or different things. Community kitchens to share food production, but also uh, food recovery and even the reuse of goods at things like the green recycling hub. 
offering city-owned facilities is a bigger effort for local governments than, for example, promoting a Facebook page, but actually all of these roles are important. And so in the local governments and sharing economy report, we highlight how a that there's this range of actions that cities can take. And you heard that from Karen Andre as well, that there is this real range. If we can go to the next slide, we actually map these this range from those that are predominantly community led to those that are uh, city led and everything in between. And other than the only community led actions, local governments can engage across the spectrum. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that they can do everything from low effort actions, such as promoting funding and supporting sharing initiatives, to educating, advocating, and building sharing into city plans, to high effort actions of demonstrating that um, sharing, for example, through procurement, city led sharing programs, owning of sharing services and regulating sharing enterprises. I thought the example that Lisbeth gave of Costa Rica actually putting uh, little or no environmental footprint into their public procurement is really interesting because that could lead to more, for example, sharing. But they can also, in order to uh, do all this work, partner with others. In Vancouver, One Earth co-launched an initiative uh, which is this kind of partnership with the city of Vancouver and other players called the Share Reuse Repair Initiative. If you go to the next slide. Uh, this initiative focuses on both building the supply and cultivating the demand for share and also reuse and repair. And the focus of this, uh, the actions are things on such as the just circular recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a big opportunity, as Lisbeth mentioned, the mainstreaming of repair, um, bolstering innovation, and uh, just like um, what Lisbeth was speaking about, a big focus on this uh, uh, of this innovation boost is in on small and medium-sized enterprises, which actually are a massive part of the business community in Vancouver. And so the bolstering of innovation is also about enabling these small and medium-sized enterprises to continue to thrive here in the city and government policies and programs, including with the city of Vancouver. And you see at the bottom, the city of Vancouver has a v Vancouver Economic Commission, which is also part of this share reuse repair initiative. And at this point in my presentation, we're already moving beyond sharing to talk about how to scale local government efforts through a broader focus, which includes sharing, reuse, repair, and other initiatives that enable sustainable consumption overall. My nonprofit One Earth worked with the North American-based Urban Sustainability Directors Network to create a toolkit. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see this toolkit, which is uh, for advancing sustainable consumption in cities across sectors from food to consumer goods to purchasing. I re recommend taking a look at this, um, this toolkit because it really provides specific initiatives and examples that local governments can take. Uh, and, you know, of course, it's a, a living document. So if you have other examples to add, they're very interested in finding out more about how to advance sustainable consumption. And note just under the title that it says here that changing the way we consume means addressing the broad array of economic, environmental, and social dimensions that form the backdrop of our choices and our ways of living. And that phrase, our ways of living, because this is the point that local governments should not just be focused on consumption, but advancing sustainable ways of living or lighter ways of living. And just like in Sweden, where there's a focus on sustainable consumption and thinking about how we can do this in cities, the city of Vancouver also is focusing on these ways of living within the earth's caring capacity. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that a very unique thing is that the Greenest City Action Plan actually has a goal focused on achieving a one planet ecological footprint. And this is about creating the conditions for one planet living. And in order to achieve this goal, uh, basically the city needs to work with community partners in order to, uh, first of all, get to the target of the 2020 target of 33%. We got quite close, but not quite there. And actually we're about to update these targets and actions next year to really be bold and ambitious in terms of what we achieve by 2030. My nonprofit One Earth is one of the partners thinking this through, and we're actually uh, co-leading a community-based or a larger movement around achieving these one planet living goals. If you go to the next slide with a partner um, 
Van City, the Canada's largest community credit union. And this Lighter Living initiative is in partnership with many different organizations, some of which you see along the side of the photographs here from the unbuilders that uh, when uh, take apart houses um, and for reusing the, the materials from renovations and from rebuilding to Hua Foundation that works with the Chinese Canadian community in Vancouver on sustainable practices to Fab Cycle that works on textiles and um, to Ernest Ice Cream, which is a uh, so small and medium sized enterprise uh, which provides a uh, great uh, ice cream, but also uh, does it in a sustainable way. So that, of course, sustainable living includes great ice cream. Um, so these are the types of organizations that we work with, but also community and, and um, centers, neighborhood partners across uh, the, the region. And what we're highlighting is where sustainable living is being supported today, including by civil society groups, enterprises, and in communities and neighborhoods. And we're catalyzing this movement around lighter living through working with partners such as the Share Reuse Repair Initiative. And this is uh, the, a big partner is also the BCIT Center for Eco Cities, led by Dr. Jenny Moore. And she has developed an eco city footprint analysis tool which actually addresses what Karen Andre was talking about around indicators that are based on data that's local. So what J Dr. Jenny Moore has done is used urban metabolism data to be able to find the, to be able to identify the carbon and ecological footprints and the urban metabolism of a city using the city's own local um, uh, bottom-up data. So sometimes uh, there's data gaps that we're filling, for example, around local food consumption, but it actually is a great complement to the national level data that many of us are using because it enables cities to track progress over time on achieving lighter lives. And we just are about to launch a lighter footprint app um, that actually allows individuals to learn what they can do to reduce their personal carbon and ecological footprints. They can build better habits by taking a footprint quiz, setting tailored personal goals, tracking progress, and connecting their individual's actions together for policy changes and changes at the systems level. And in this way, we're enabling both cities and citizens to work together in order to achieve uh, living within the Earth's caring capacity and connecting that also to market and cultural actors in order to really shift uh, towards lighter living. I just want to note that the Eco City Footprint tool is um, being used by 10 different BC municipalities. We're going to be spreading the Lighter Footprint app to those municipalities well as well. And uh, Jenny Moore has worked with this tool around the world. And so this partnership of cities learning from each other is a big part of what we're focused on as well. So when I think about uh, lighter living, as opposed to focusing on consumption, it really means a shift of focusing not only on greening products and services, on purchasing and consumption, but also broadening our perspective on what constitutes living a good and meaningful life and more of what matters, such as trust, social connections, purpose, joy, how we care for each other, the power of open space for people in nature, and not just thinking about how we can share stuff, but also asking what is the what are the essential goods? How do we make sure they're quality and they stay with us long enough? How do we rethink the good life and how much is enough? And it's also about shifting the burden away from thinking about individuals to the enabling context that we've been speaking about today in culture, policies, markets, institutions, and infrastructures, which are of course reinforced by individuals' behaviors. And I would say we can also really learn from other countries who is living one planet lives today, because as Jonas mentioned, there's a vast diversity in terms of where these high footprints are happening and those who don't have enough, and many who are also already living one planet lives today. And this is what we're addressing in our new global initiative. This is our my next and final slide, which is the beacon for sustainable living. It's co-led with a nonprofit, Hard or Cool, supported by the KR Foundation. And it's really about focusing on this broader perspective of sustainable living. One of our partner programs is with the C40 Cities Thriving Cities Initiative, and together we're looking beyond consumption to how cities can be home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting well-being of all people justly within our ecological means. And they do this through a thriving cities roadmap 
and the beacon helps imagine what sustainable living could look like, draws on local policies that governments can put into place, and brings together some of the most powerful ways we can communicate and engage on sustainable living as we move forward on these goals. So we welcome you to join us. And our, my final slide, thank you very much. Um, I look forward to the discussion and please be in touch if this work is of interest to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, for this very good presentation with, uh, with many, I think, very interesting uh, initiative. Uh, so now we will move on to the discussion uh, session. Uh, and I will start off uh, this discussion with with a question to to all of you, uh, and that is, uh, what would your best advice or takeaways? Uh, what would it be when looking on the work on sustainable uh, consumption for for local governments? I think you all you know addressed it a little bit, but if you can give you you know your highlights uh, on this. It will be great. Does Karin maybe want to start? Yes, I can start. So the question was, what is my take home message as regards to how local governments can work with sustainable consumption? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so the first thing that comes to my mind is really I want to emphasize that there is a great opportunity for local governments to to address sustainable consumption and as we saw in our study that they have a lot of potential which is sort of uh, underutilized at the moment as regards to procurement as regards to acting as a role model within their own operations but also to act as this uh, positive or what do you say not inspiration but facilitating change at the local level by providing the right structures for for residents or for other local actors and but to be able to do this there was a need to have more support and guidance so it, it's not so it doesn't get uh, one yeah one I'm looking for a word here but something you do once and then it's done but you need to have a long-term work and also see the connections between different consumption areas that also align it with other areas of work Thank you. I'll start there at least. Vanessa, would you like to follow up on that? Yeah, I'll just pick up on what Karen was just saying that I think the the um, the opportunity is really to uh, to think about um, sustainable consumption. I think one of the ways we get stuck is when we think about it as being uh, the end of the the end of the of the sustainability uh, initiative. So it's kind of when consumers pick up uh, what's being offered from the supply side. But actually, when we the power of the sustainable consumption and sustainable living lens is to actually flip it around and ask what is what could local governments do to create the conditions for one planet living, and then what supply side is needed in order to meet that. So I would just encourage the to um, rather than thinking of it as kind of the end of the of the strategy to, to flip it around and say, what is our what are good lives that we want to be supporting that are just and within one planet um, uh, within our ecological capacity? Um, and then to start uh, looking at everything, as Karen's mentioning, from infrastructure to procurement in terms of setting the conditions for that. So I just would want to raise our level of ambition from small scale consumption understanding to um, to focusing on enabling sustainable living. Thank you, Vanessa. Lisbeth, do you have any uh, further comment on that? Well, I, I very much agree with uh, with uh, Vanessa and, and Karen here. I think um, local governments as well as national governments need to to dare and to to understand the uh, the power that they actually have to create that enabling environment. And I think procurement is is part of that story, but is is not is not the only one. Uh, so I think it's very much the the focus on that enabling 
uh, and on that enabling factor and to use that also in a strategic way uh, where it's about the small consumption. I think citizens today are already very well informed on what they what they should or, or could not uh, do or what are the, the pathways forward. But uh, it's up to, to municipalities and governments to provide places to come together and to, to scale, to, to use the demand and to create the demand for those sustainable markets, because that will allow citizens to um, to, to kind of become part of that market. And, and that's also the way in which sustainability becomes more, more affordable. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's a discussion that's still very real in most countries all over the world. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we've got one question from Simon in, in the chat, uh, and I'm gonna read it out loud. Are there any particular toolkits or toolkits or approaches that are being used by Swedish municipality for both determining action and also men, uh, me measuring consumption-based emission? And I think I think your Karin started writing an answer, but maybe you want to elaborate a little bit more on that. Yes, thanks. I can do that. And I also talked to my colleague Katarina Axelsson that mentioned that. that there is a lot of work and measures undertaken among the Swedish municipalities and uh, there are some good networks like the climate municipalities where they gather a lot of resources and good examples and we also have the Forum for Miljö Smart Consumption. It's like the fora for environmental friendly consumption, which is led by the consumer agency in Sweden. So I pasted to a link to their website where there's also a, a great uh, source of good examples and projects of what Swedish municipalities are doing and as regards to let's see what question it was a question about the uh, determining actions and measuring consumption based emissions and here i can just flag that we have an, a project at sai which we call the accelerating agenda 2030 which is uh, building partly on the results from the unlock project where my colleagues katarina and elena dawkins and Others are developing a tool that uh, that should uh, support municipalities with calculating and get a better understanding of the emissions and also provide support for developing actions in the end or measures. So that was a brief answer to that questions. And uh, yeah. Yeah, and also sure I would more. like to mention. Yeah, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, also, I would like to mention the, uh, an initiative that you have also at SEI uh, that is actually trying to develop consumption-based uh, emissions on a regional level. And parallel also Statistics Sweden is, is doing uh, the same thing. And I think they're elaborating and uh, uh, trying to solve this. Uh, and I think in the end of 2021, they will have some, uh, some results. So I think that is also a very interesting project that we are, are um, developing right now. And the Swedish EPA is also one of the uh, financier uh, behind this um, project. Um, I can also mention, uh, I was thinking was about the procurement agency in Sweden that's also doing quite a lot on this, that also developing a tool for analysis of the purchases. And I think there's information available on their website as well regarding this. Yeah, thank you, Karin. Uh, so we have one more question in the chat. Uh, I will try to see if I get this right. I think the question is about uh, the limits of uh, quantitative data to understand these really, you know, complex and uh, initiative ways that people enact in sustainable living. So I guess it's hard to actually measure, you know, the development of sustainable living. Uh, and how can you like, sort of quantify the measures that you have if you if you have a a garden that you try to promote biodiversity and 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 so on? So I think that is one question, and the, the other one is how can we actually know how, what people want? Uh, do people really want to know want to live sustainable lives uh, or not? Uh, I guess. 
So is there anyone who would like to yeah. pick up on, on that question? Thanks, Jonas. Uh, thank you, Ashley, for that question and for that comment. I think you're absolutely correct that the quantitative data is really critical for understanding where we're at in terms of footprints and um, in terms of urban metabolism. And there's many ways to measure that. But what we're talking about is very much about the qualitative aspects of people's lives. And uh, certainly within the city of Vancouver, the uh, public participation aspects of developing things like the Greenest City Action Plan, such as like um, uh, they did, we've been doing many, many kind of engagements that are much more about uh, the qualitative um, aspects and engaging participants uh, in many uh, different interactive uh, workshops and um, public consultations and activities and collaborative uh, group meetings and committees to get that fuller and richer perspective of what, of, of kind of co-defining what the city could do and what people are wanting. What I wanted to mention specifically is that uh, there's this sense sometimes that sustainable living or sustainable consumption is really for the eco niche, for, the, for those who have green motivations but we've actually been working with Citra, the Finnish Innovation Fund. They did a really interesting um, study looking at the motivations that people have that lead them to sustainable living actions or sustainable consumption actions. And they found that there's actually a much larger array of motivations that lead to sustainable living actions beyond the green eco niche. So it could be everything from people's uh, desire to meet a basic need, for example, for survival, to uh, for health, for um, finding things that are of quality, to um, actually following trends and being interested in what their peers are doing. So I think this is really good news for all of us because cities often think, well, how big is my environmental stakeholder group? But actually, the motivations that lead to sustainable lives can be quite diverse and so we're doing that exact same survey right now here in southwest british columbia and we'll be um, looking at taking it across canada the first 600 out of the 1500 people who will be responding have already responded in the last couple of days and we're starting to look at what what's motivating people uh in terms of sustainable living actions so it's just another part of what you're talking about ashley that we need to get into what's motivating people what how do they understand their daily lives and actually um, engaging with them in terms of their needs and the way that they define uh, what they see as being priorities. Um, and so one of the things that will be coming out of that study is uh, recommendations for government, for markets, for community organizations to engage people with where they're at. And interestingly, by the way, these motivations might shift across their lives, across sectors. So it's also not one motivation per person, but thinking about it in that diverse way. So thank you, Ashley, for that for that question. And thank you, Vanessa. Uh, I think we also have one comment comment about a uh, Finnish Belgium research team that are looking at ways to improve the measurement and monitoring of greening of public uh, uh, procurement. Uh, is this not, maybe this is addressed to you, Vanessa, if, if that is something you are aware of. I think maybe that would be Lisbeth. Do you know of the greening of public procurement? Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, I can, uh, I, I, I don't know of the, the specific uh, uh, research on on the the measurement and the and the monitoring, but it's being uh, it's been done in a in a variety uh, of places exactly to be able to inform government one what is the impact if we do procure let's say uh, lower carbon materials in infrastructure projects just by by means of example. Um, perhaps one one resource that I that I can point at is that uh, on the website of the EU Green Public Procurement, and I'll I'll put it in the in the chat there as a, um, in a in a moment. There's a there's a wealth of resources where you see what are the different actions that that countries are undertaking to uh, to monitor what are the specific areas of focus for national governments, but also on city level, um, I, I know there's many cities also looking at uh, social well-being aspects of, of public procurement and how public procurement can actually engage with the more vulnerable communities um, and uh, provide them actually in terms of, of access to the procurement markets uh, with better, better quality jobs. Um, 
that is something uh, that also in, in a lot of Canadian cities, I believe, um, comes uh, high, high up uh, on, the, on the agenda uh, these days. Um, so I'll, I'll put a link in a, in a chat there, many ways for, for monitoring and, and measuring, but it's definitely important. Um, and perhaps, and that links to the, the previous comments in terms of the engagement with citizens, I think today with um, all the apps and all the, uh, the digitalization the, that offers a huge opportunity to channel feedback from citizens in the cases that I know back to procurement agencies on how happy they are with the services that the city is actually procuring. And uh, there's, I know of an example in the Dominican Republic, the whole other end, um, where um, uh, citizens can can directly provide feedback uh, towards the National Procurement Agency on, for example, the procurement of school uniforms, whether they are actually in good quality. Because one of the channel uh, of the challenges for procurers is that they buy something, for example, for public schools, but they are not the the direct. They're not in contact with the direct beneficiary of that procurement, right? So we need to to enable that knowledge to to flow back to to procurement agencies. And there, I think today we have a lot of opportunities. Thank you, Lisbeth. Uh, and I think we I can't see any more questions in the chat uh, and I think we will respect the time that we were given. So I will take this moment just to to thank you all to all your speakers uh, for a very good presentation and for a very fruitful discussion. Uh, I think this was really interesting. Uh, and with that, I will give the word to you, Aina, for some conclude, uh, conclusion remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas, and thank you, Lisbeth and Karin and Vanessa. Your presentations have been very informative and also inspirational. Um, it's very good to tie together the different roles and activities that local governments can take and that they have in advancing sustainable consumption. And I think your presentations have really given a, an in-depth insight to the different pathways to, to advance that work. So thank you very much for taking the time and participating. And thank you to our audience that has been active and, and posed your questions. Um, I'd like to say that the, the webinar has been recorded and we will be sending out uh, this link along with the presentation slides to everyone that has registered. Um, I'd also like to mention that we do have a mailing list um, here at SEI where we will provide information on everything relating to the transition to sustainable societies. And if you'd like to sign up to that mailing list, the link is in the chat. Um, and as you can see here on the last slide, there are just some um, links to our to the home pages of the different organizations that have taken part in the webinar today, which will again be sent out um, to all of you uh, in just a few hours. So thank you very much. And I wish all of you um, a great rest of your day and week.